inputs from our panelists on the supplementary budget, highlighting uh, key issues and uh, insights, uh, maybe you know five to ten minutes maximum. Uh, and then we'll follow that up with a round of questions, uh, then give the panelists an opportunity to respond and carry on in that way uh, until we reach our time limit, which I understand is an hour at one o'clock. So uh, we're not going to toss a coin here. So uh, Tabi, are you ready to go first? I can. Okay, um, please, so over to you. So say 10 minutes maximum, if you can. Give us the right. key insights into the budget. Okay. Over so to you. Um, both the president and the finance minister have um, described this pandemic as a war. And this is also a word that has been used by many leaders uh, around the world. And uh, given, you know, after the, the supplementary budget, I'm convinced, more convinced than ever, that I am unlikely, or these are the two people that I would not want to um, go to, for them to be my soldiers in a war, to lead a war with me, only because they may not bring the right ammunition to the war to kill the enemy or the appropriate ammunition. So that's how I felt about the, the supplementary budget. I felt that um, we had a great opportunity to deal with um, some of the deep centered issues, but we didn't. And I believe that we continue to kick the can down the road. Uh, one of the, you know, one of the, what, what the budget did was that we, there was a, you know, the consolidated spending increased. So the expenditure of, this, uh, of the budget increased slightly. I think it increased to the extent of dealing with the health issues and also the economic issues. So I felt that it didn't, it's, uh, the support is not sufficient to uh, provide uh, the economy with the buffer that is required. And uh, therefore, I am particularly worried about our future and also our ability to pay back debt. So on debt, the debt to GDP, def, uh, uh, the debt to GDP uh, is expected to increase to 81.3% this year and stabilize to about 87.4% in around 2023, so in three years' time. And I also don't believe that is possible. I, the, the budget provided two graphs or two scenarios, which were one of them was a passive and an active scenario, where the active scenario is what the numbers that I had mentioned, the more passive uh, scenario had a lot far worse uh, deficit numbers. Now, I don't mind debt, and because there's good debt and bad debt. Good debt is debt which is um, where you borrow and then you spend on, or you allocate or spend on areas that will either generate growth or that have an economic multiplier effect. So you borrow in the same way as somebody who's an entrepreneur would borrow from the bank uh, to start a business and the business is thriving, you pay back your debt, but you're still uh, running your business and you're doing well. I don't think that we have indicated or demonstrated that should we take on more debt, which is what we're doing, that we are able to ensure that this debt will have a multiplier effect, um, uh, an economic multiplier effect that will help support economic growth. I also am worried about our credibility and, uh, and I've been, you know, I've always criticized our fiscal credibility and I've said that, you know, over the years, we've set our policy since 2012 was that we're going to shrink the, uh, the, um, the budget deficit through a spending ceiling that we put in place in 2012. And since then, we've been attempting to uh, cut expenditure. And that in the recent past has not been successful. And instead, we've thrown in state-owned entities. And uh, recently, we've added also fee-free education that put a lot of pressure on the fiscus. I would have, you know, we still haven't dealt with, if anyone had to ask me what is our fiscal policy, I'm not certain. I know that obviously in a crisis, you spend and you support the economy through spending and you, you um, uh, borrow as a result, but then you have to indicate post the pandemic how we're going to shrink this budget deficit and how we're going to get our numbers back to normal and, and stabilize debt. I'm not convinced that 
I understood how we we're going to do that through um, the supplementary budget. So I'm concerned about our fiscal credibility and I'm also concerned about how investors are going to respond to, the, to um, this budget. Already what happened when after the budget we saw uh, the, you know, the yields, uh, bond yields rallied and um, the curve, the bond curve indicated that investors are not satisfied with this uh, supplementary uh, budget. And that is concerning because it means that the very people who've been supporting our economy, are supporting our current account, supporting our RAND, ha are not convinced that we, are, we will set out to do what we said we would do in the budget. Um, so I am worried. I think the only thing that saves us in this environment is that we are, we're in this with the rest of the world. So the rest of the world is borrowing and the rest of the world is trying to, to, to it, it will incur and is incurring a deficit. Uh, and the rest of the world is seeing um, the economy contract. But to quote Warren Buffett, it is only when the tide comes out do we really know who's been swimming naked. And I fear that after the pandemic, when the fiscal relief has been, uh, borne fruits in some of the, the countries, that I feel that with in South Africa's case, we will be one of the few countries that are, are um, will be exposed and that we've been uh, swimming naked. Great, thank you very much. You were very disciplined there. Uh, I understand Lumkile is with us. Welcome, Lumkile. Good afternoon, Prof, and good afternoon to my colleagues. Okay, sorry, I was okay. a bit late. I was trying to connect. Thank you. Okay, so we're having the initial presentations. We're going to have the second presentation by Isaiah Mishlanga now, and then we'll come uh, over to you. But great to see you. Uh, so, Isaiah, over to you. Thank you, Prof. Um, I'm just going to make a few observations uh, instead of uh, uh, you know, repeating what is in the budget or what Tavi has already yeah. outlined. Um, for me, the budget has been silent on some big issues that we have been grappling with for quite some time, uh, i.e. how we deal with some of the state-owned enterprises. Out of the land bank, it is very silent on SA, it's very silent on, on ESCOM, it is silent on any other SOEs. And, but we know these are some of the institutions that have exerted a lot of pressure on the, on the fiscals. Secondly, a debt spiral is on the horizon. It has been taking place for a very long time. And in fact, it's a continuation of where we started just after the financial crisis, where we added a trillion rand, and it's going to continue. But what it means is, uh, in future, we are going to have to hike taxes uh, one way or the other uh, to finance uh, ourselves um, uh, going forward. And a fiscal, uh, the, the third point is a fiscal deficit will balloon. Yes, it is like many other countries, but unfortunately for us, it comes at a point when we're already weak in terms of our economic growth before COVID happened, uh, which means it's going to be quite difficult for us to consolidate but what we see from the budget is, if you look at 2022-2023 projections, there is a consolidation part that is north of 5% of GDP. And it is quite difficult to see how will that be possible if we could not consolidate to lower fiscal deficits, even when economic growth was very strong. So that for me is really um, an, an issue. But if you also look at the growth forecast, which is the, the third point, the growth forecast post 2022, they're quite modest, 1.5%. Uh, uh, South Africa is an economy that requires an economic growth rate of at least 4.5% to stabilize G uh, debt to GDP ratio. And that only gives us the economy that we had before COVID. But even that economy is not enough because it was not generating jobs so we need economic growth rate that is far higher than 4.5% on a sustained level over the next decade. So a 1.5% economic growth rate uh, means we will have significant problems with unemployment, with servicing our debt, uh, and, and it will actually maybe lead us to the hippopotamus belly, which is the IMF, 
where we are likely to, 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 to be confined in terms of how we make our policies. And the last point um, that I want to make is that the consolidation part is not plausible, particularly if you consider the need to reduce your fiscal deficit from 15.7% to 7.7% over a two year period. There is no way we are going to be able to do that um, especially if you consider that our spending is very inflexible. Uh, even now in the middle of a, of a pandemic, labor is telling us they want increases which were signed uh, in 2018 uh, as part of the wage agreement. So which means we are unlikely to be able to cut that spending. Uh, so our consolidation part, instead of being based on improving economic growth, it is based on cutting spending, which we know very well that is very difficult to do. So once again, we are going to fail to deliver to the market and to investors what we promised or what we said we are going to do, simply because one, we set ourselves two ambitious targets, uh, which are politically difficult to, 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 to implement. So those are my, my, few, my few remarks uh, or observations that I, I check out of the budget. Too ambitious and, 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 and unlikely to be able to be achieved, especially over the medium term. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, Lumkila, over to you for your thoughts. Maximum 10 minutes, please. Thank you so much uh, to Isaiah as well as Tadi. I think many of us had anticipated the minister to present um, a lot around uh, what he had talked on what you call structural, structural economic reforms, um, supported by very definite uh, physical uh, stance, which as uh, Zaha has put on the table, um, uh, did not come to, uh, to, as expected. Um, secondly, I think uh, we should not forget that the Treasury has been at the center um, of a spending spree particularly between 20, uh, 20, um, 2010 up to about 2018, um, driving uh, what was seen as a state-led investment drive, where SOCs such as Transnet, Prasa, and ESCOM were seen as vehicles uh, for economic growth. This was despite the fact that GDP growth forecast and, 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 and revenue collected by the, by the government were all dropping or below um, what was uh, forecast by the Treasury. Treasury was doing all this, uh, supporting a political program of radical economic transformation that wanted to change the structure of, of ownership of the certain economy um, and redress the past inequalities. We all know now that in October, 1926, uh, Tulima Tonsela presented the state capture report that showed that those those President Zuma had benefited from the state's investment program, which the Treasury had funded throughout. The state, capture, the state of capture report had played a very big role in the appointment uh, of President Ramaphosa as the president of the ANC and later as the president of the country. Facing a shortage of skill and capable finance minister who could be trusted by South Africans, Tito Mboyen was then called uh, or, or recruited back from retirement to fulfill the role of the finance minister. Arguably, it was the return of the class of 1996 with both Mboweni and Lisetja Khanyako, the governor of the Central Bank, who was a deputy general, director general and later a director general under Trump Emmanuel, when Minister Mboweni was the governor of the Central Bank. And many critics saw the class of 96 as aligned to what is referred to as neoliberal policies, uh, which are associated with the World Bank and IMF, which, who are notorious in developing and emerging economies for implementing social adjustment programs that include devolution of currencies, export-led economic growth, privatization, and the reduction of the public sector. So looking at Mboweni's budget yesterday, his reference uh, to the Bible, quoting Apostle Matthew chapter seven, verse 13 and 14, about the small and narrow gate and the wide and broad gate as the only choices facing the nation, 
makes the same mistake of locating South Africa's economic challenges in, the dual, in their dual form. We must remember that it was Mandela who, was, who adopted the growth employment and redistribution policies, believing the alternative will lead to an economic catastrophe. Mbegi also spoke of the first and second economy. My observation is that the use of duality to describe our economic challenge is an attempt to instill fear to the nation while an austerity program is being implemented. It is ideological and redistributes South Africa's wealth in favor of the incumbents, marginalizing those who have been outside the economy, thus reinforcing our structural unemployment, po poverty, and inequality. In South Africa, it also reinforces the race and gender gap, while condemning many, many Black South Africans to, to destitution and reliance on the social wage. Um, just to conclude, I want to argue that there has been an alternative that's been presented firstly in the current debate on our economy by heterodox economic scholars, such as Professor Chris Malikane, our colleague at VETS, and Dumak Kubula, who have presented alternative to South Africa's neoliberal economic dogma. Reminiscent of the academics who advised the ANC in the transition period that led to the democratic election in 1994, described by Professor Pariashi and Robert van Niekerk in their book, Shadows of Liberation, that there were other policy so choices other than gear. So Mboweni has elected to ignore the scholarship, and uh, not only in the budget, but throughout the policy intervention. Malikane and Kubule argue that Mboweni has at his disposal both the fiscal and monetary policies at hand. That debt that is owned to South Africa is our debt. Therefore, as long as our debt is run pace, we can sleep well at night because we owe it to ourselves. In the supplementary budget, Mboweni has secured a $1 billion facility from the NDP, the Development Bank, and is negotiating other facilities with the IMF and the FDP. Not only have South Africans been denied the terms and tenure of the concluded loans with the NTP to ESCOM, Transnet, and recently the Severin, but these facilities expose South Africa to interest and foreign currency volatilities, which could be uh, offset by borrowing locally. The SAB, the Southern Reserve Bank, arguably can play a much bigger role by lending aggressively to the Treasury. It is South Africa's debt, after all, as Malikane and Kabul have argued. Whereas the US Fed and the Bank of England have looked innovatively in supporting the US and the British economies, the SAP has, in a limited way, also attempted to, resp to respond to the economic challenges. But it is not enough. Finally, by Mboweni centering the supplementary budget as a debt uh, problem that will be accompanied by social reforms at a later date uh, to be announced. He has sharpened the debate on the budget and economic policy, pitting the status quo against pragmatic heterodox scholarship. As unemployment increases from 30.1% in the first quarter, debt approaching 100% of the GDP, inequality and poverty widening, South Africa could find itself under a wave of populism that will look at the sub and print money aggressively pushing prices up, increases demand of foreign goods, and a, and a populist political regime. It may sound alarmist, but Argentina springs to mind, as Governor Hanyaho has argued. It will not be surprising, because it will have been to the failure to adopt more heterodox policies, using the sub to lend to government, and the relaxation of Regulation 28 to allow pension funds to invest on lower return infrastructure projects. I'll finish. Thank, thanks, Prof. Thank you, uh, Lumkile. Um, if you have questions, you can put them on the Q&A or on the, on the Zoom chat. Uh, so there are four questions already there. So I'm going to start and ask the panelists uh, the questions one by one. The first question from Vonani uh, is on monetary policy, which uh, 
Lumkile has already briefly touched on. And the specific question is, uh, what are the panelists thoughts on quantitative easing? Uh, because there seems to be a reluctance uh, going that route. And is that reluctance, I suppose, uh, warranted? Uh, so, uh, Isaiah, do you want to take the first shot at that? Uh, what are your thoughts on quantitative easing? Thank you, Prof. Perhaps what, what I would say firstly is there is somehow this belief currently in the South African policy discourse that fiscal policy problems have monetary policy solutions over a sustained period of time. And quite honestly, that, that belief is not correct. There is no monetary policy solution to a fiscal policy problem. We can argue that from 2009 to 2019, we increased our debt by a trillion rand. What did we spend that money for? Where is the infrastructure? Where are the schools? Where are the roads? Where is ESCOM with regards to its power plants? Still not, not finished. Yet a trillion rand has been spent. What is so fundamentally different this time around such that even if the Reserve Bank were to, to print money, we will be guaranteed that we are going to see a different type of spending that generates jobs than what we have seen over the last decade. That, for me, still remains unanswered. But then let's, let's, let's uh, address the issue of quantitative easing uh, 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 directly. South Africa is not the Fed, or the Reserve Bank is not the Fed, it is not the Bank of England, it is not the ECB, it is not the Bank of Japan. We are one of an emerging market, a very small open economy, which prints rents, which no other country in the world wants, wants to hold, except the, sub, the SACU countries. Not even Zimbabwe on our north would want to hold the rent. They've been refused, refusing to get into the rent common area because um, uh, for them, other currencies are far superior. But the point that I want to make here is we do not have a reserve currency to allow ourselves to print money sustainably uh, to finance ourselves. We have to do things in a more traditional way. But perhaps over the short term, we could say monetary policy can play a role to bridge the gap uh, over a short term with clear exit points to say, when do we let go of these emergency measures? Because um, let's, let's, let's accept it. These unconventional ways are really emergency measures which have been adopted by many central banks. Now, can we do QE without causing inflation in a South African context? It's not possible. Uh, we, if we do QE, it will result in inflation or else we have to sterilize uh, that money printing, which will come at a significant cost. So sooner or later, the value of the currency is going to, de to, to, to decline quite significantly, such that even if we were to be able to print money over a very long uh, period of time, ultimately that money will lose value, which is what we see in our neighbors north, where yes, they can print money, but that money is not even worth the paper that it is printed on. So what value does it add over a long period of time? But my last point really that, that I would want to say here is, let's not get into the fallacy or into the selfishness of over indebting future generations because of the decisions that we as the current generation fail to make uh, by, by making sure that we spend within our means and we spend on things that generate better livelihoods for future generations. But as far as QE is concerned, uh, I think the sub has done what, it, what, what, what is necessary to provide liquidity. And if we can guarantee fiscal sustainability, I think they can do more by doing yield curve control that will lessen the cost of government uh, in terms of its borrowings. But as we, as we, we, we observed in the, mini bu in the budget uh, that was tabled a, a, a few days ago, uh, there is no guarantee of fiscal sustainability. Um, now the, 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 the heavy lifting is thrown on the Reserve Bank to print money. 
which ultimately is going to, to make sure that South Africa's livelihoods are going to be destroyed over time, as we see in our neighbors north. Thank you. Uh, is Tabi with us? Or I don't see a picture here. Yes, she's reconnected. She's she's I am connected. Uh, okay, great. Do you want to respond to that QE question, quantitative easing? So I agree absolutely with what um, Isaiah has said. I think there are cost implications to, to quantitative easing. And um, I know that there are lots of criticism and um, Lumkile and a few other economists have mentioned that the Reserve Bank has not done enough. And I'd argue the opposite. If you look at what the Reserve Bank has done given its constraints, uh, um, it has done sufficiently. And, and given the country's constraints, Firstly, I think we need to understand that fiscal policy leads monetary policy, not the other way around. So if fiscal policy is not working, monetary policy won't, won't work. Here's an example of, uh, of, of the situation. So the, the central bank, the reserve bank has cut interest rates by 275 basis points this year alone. The impact on, of that on the economy has been marginal. And that's because uh, the very poor and the increasingly unemployed people have have actually, you know, cutting interest rates haven't had an, hasn't had an impact on them. It has had an impact on those of us who are leveraged. So we have exposure to the bank through vehicle and, and bond repayments, etc., and loans. And then the cost of servicing those loans has depreciated. And so some, only a few of us get that text message from our banks to say that the cost of borrowing is less. And also businesses have, um, are privileged enough to also receive that message and they can go out and extend their loan facilities. The majority of South Africans uh, don't have uh, access to those facilities, don't have, aren't leveraged, cutting interest rates doesn't really impact them directly. And that is where the problem lies. The other problem is that in our, in our discussions in South Africa, we tend to forget, we talk about labor, we talk about business, um, government, we tend to forget the investor. And investors play a very critical role in actually in the stabilization and the, the growth of our economy because they are the ones that buy our equities and bonds both in, uh, international and domestic investors. Uh, and they're the ones that fund our current account deficit. So when they, do, you know, they don't respond to a rate cut, typically when the, interest rate, when the Reserve Bank cuts rates, uh, what happens is that the yields uh, um, are, respond positively. So the, the, the yields go down. But what has happened is that the opposite has, has happened in the past uh, interest rates moves. And that's because investors actually are not convinced about South Africa. Uh, another thing I'll get a little bit technical is if you look at the bond curve, what um, your Klugules uh, uh, and your Malekanes forget, interest rates are you know, the whole range of interest rates from short term to the uh, long term interest rates, they range across the bond yield curve. So we need to ensure that the entire interest rate curve is impacted. So a monetary a cut in interest rates, the, the uh, transmission me mechanism is goes through the entire curve. What we're seeing actually is that it's not the long end of the curve. Uh, investors are uh, disinvesting and are moving to those, towards the shorter end, those who are still invested in South Africa. And that just also is an implication of confidence that they may not want to be in South Africa invested in, in a long-term 10-year bond yield, for instance, but would rather be in a shorter end um, of the curve and where they can easily come in and out and they're not uh, totally committed. That is where the problem lies to ask you the too. entire yeah. curve. Just one last one. I know that um, as I mentioned, curve control um, that the Reserve Bank can do. It's very difficult to, to, to control the yield curve when investors themselves are the ones that determine uh, where the, you know, the yield curve. So if the investors think that the country is going to default, that's what they're going to do and they're going to respond accordingly. There's nothing that anyone can do to intervene. So then confidence needs to be built and we cannot rely on one institution because everything has failed. Fiscal policy determines also that the Minister of Housing or and, set and Human Settlement needs to be the one that ensures that the houses that are built, the Reserve Bank can't do that. 
Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, Lumkila, do you want to add anything to what you said already on this yes. point? Uh, just to, to, to emphasize the point again, uh, Professor Pillay, that we have in the balance sheet of Reserve Bank reserves, we are in an emergency situation. We are foreseeing an un unemployment rate of about 40% post the, the pandemic. Is it too much to ask for us to use a resource that is available, that is ours, to tap into it, not to eat, as some of the QE people are arguing, because with the history of corruption, the others who see a pot of gold in the reserve bank that can be accessed. Here we're saying, let's access these um, reserves um, to ensure that we invest on infrastructure, we enable our economy to have lower cost of doing business. It cannot only be individuals where we are asking them uh, to put part of their pension on fixed investment. We're asking the bank, please use some of your a balance sheet to lend to treasury so that South Africa's debt is, continues to be strongly biased to South Africans because it is easier for us to repay a debt that we owe to ourselves. Thank you. Okay, thank you all three. Uh, I'm going to move on to the second question which is from Paul Hoffman, uh, which is also to all panelists. And that is, uh, instead of hiking taxes, how about recovering the loot of state capture? I'll repeat it. Instead of hiking taxes, how about recovering the loot of state capture? Okay, I'm oh, sorry you're smiling there, so I guess you have the answer to this one. No, I don't have a, a, an answer to it, Prof, but uh, I, all I would want to say on, on this part is the recovery of monies of state capture really is within the, the legal profession, our court system or judiciary. And that is not something that the treasury can do. Uh, it is in a different institution that is tasked doing uh, those kind of in investigations. But to address the question of uh, what is the alternative to taxes, I think hiking taxes in the current environment is not is not the right thing to do. It further depresses economic growth. Uh, I wouldn't think even over the next three years, hiking taxes would make sense given the economic growth forecast which we have currently, increasing joblessness that we are going to observe also is going to detract from, from disposable income. So if we hike taxes, we'll further depress economic, economic growth. The only solution that we have currently is to really boost economic growth to do those structural reforms that will make the private sector uh, pour its money um, uh, uh, in, in, in those investments in such a way that we generate enough economic growth that will generate tax revenues. That is one solution that we can do. It's not consolidation, it's not cutting spending, uh, it's not hiking taxes. It is really to generate enough economic growth. Once you generate enough economic growth, debt ceases to be a problem which will also give you room to actually um, uh, transform the economy. You can't transform the economy by cutting taxes. And in fact, even monetary policy itself, if you use monetary policy, we have observed that it increases inequality. Let's take one instrument, for instance, the 200 billion uh, credit guarantee scheme that was put together by Treasury in conjunction with the Reserve Bank and commercial banks. Because it goes through commercial banks, which have their credit uh, uh, models that are skewed away from small medium enterprises, they have not yet lent a significant portion of that money to small medium enterprises, which so need it to survive, given that their cash flows are quite constrained. And again, this is an instrument that is made available, it is there, which we could say it's a small QE or a QE very light because it's still guaranteed by the state but it's not flowing to where it is required. What then will make us believe that if we do it on a bigger scale, this is, this, these funds are going to flow to where they are required. The issue is the banking sector is untransformation, transformation, or at least the, the instruments which they use 
they do not make sure that funds flow to where they are required. So they would have perhaps uh, did it, uh, done it uh, differently by making sure that non-banking financial institutions uh, or even treasury themselves, they come up with a, an instrument that makes sure that it lends directly to small medium enterprises in the same way that the cash transfers to people that have not been uh, that have been laid off jobs have been getting money directly from national treasury why can't they do it with small businesses Mkile, hiking taxes versus recovering the loot let me talk about the loot first uh, because that's easier we have seen work done by the world bank uh, specifically focusing on the um, north uh, not not africa as well as the middle east where there were sp uh, there were arab springs um which in fact some of them were triggered by uh, corruption and lack of uh, civil liberties very this work shows that once you have got corruption in a society such as ours um it's very difficult for you to get rid of and i think south africa is on that slope where corruption is embedded and is the cost of doing business. So therefore, it is something that you're going to have to live with for a long, long, long time until um, the incentive uh, by Mion Cronier or the head of, of the NPA starts not only arresting the small fries, but catching the big fish that sit at the Tule House as well as at the unit buildings, because that's where the problems are. On the tax hike, our tax was hollow, uh, hollowed out by the governing party and its cronies. So uh, creating uh, a tax morality uh, is work that's being done at the moment by Keith Vita. But whether it's going to succeed, given the fact that with the lack of clamping down corruption, individuals and companies are saying our money is better with us than the government that's gonna waste it and give it to the Kuptas and other cronies linked to the ANC led alliance so that's a moral dilemma that south africa faces and i'm worried that both on corruption we're gonna lose as we'll do on tax hiking tax won't yield the revenue that you want because of the morality that people don't believe that the Governance structures do what is good for society. Abi? So I, I think to answer the, uh, the tax part in terms of can you recoup um, money from corruption instead of um, you know, hiking taxes, you can't budget based on the money that you assume will be collected. Uh, because we don't know yet how much money can be collected. If we say that you know, one billion has been stolen. We don't know whether we will be, you know, we, we are able to recoup that one billion. And therefore we can't then say we can't increase taxes because we're going to, re, you know, there's one billion that has been stolen. And that's the problem with theft. And, and I think the problem, we should ensure that there are no leakages to begin with and there's no theft. And if there is theft, then we need to ensure that the legal justice system works in a way that, is efficient and can recoup at least most of it. Um, but we cannot plan whatever we get back, that's great. But unfortunately, we can't, you know, budgeting process can't, um, can't operate under the assumption that you're going to recoup anything. Uh, and, and so that, and, and that's unfortunately what it is. But in terms of taxes, it is, you know, it, it's very difficult. I know that the, in the budget, they said that they would uh, look to raising um, taxes to try to raise about 40 billion, uh, 40 billion rands. And, um, you know, when you look at where they could do that, I think that the sin taxes are, are the easy options. Um, but to increase VAT, I was on the VAT panel as a, because we increased VAT to 15%. And, and we can't, you can't increase VAT or increase, you know, many of the taxes when you're in um, this kind of economic predicament and because you still need to generate to stimulate growth so i, I don't think they have an option to increase that 
I actually don't think, I think increasing corporate income tax would be very anti-competitive because uh, most countries globally have uh, um, lowered their corporate income tax and we seem to be slightly on the upper end, increasingly so, as more and more countries cut their corporate income tax. So we need to be very careful. If anything, we need to, you know, we need to cut rather than hike it. Um, personal income tax, you know, I was listening to the, uh, the commissioner and there is a lot of leakages within SARS itself. And he says that compared to if he looks around, you know, generally around your know, Santon areas and your rich areas in South Africa, he mentioned Santon in particular, um, and the assets that he just calculates just by looking versus what people claim their assets are doesn't correlate. So again, I think that he needs to tighten um, uh, tax collection and it's quite clear that a lot of South Africans are not uh, paying taxes and there we can we can raise revenue and instead of increasing taxes by ensuring that uh, people are honest about uh, the amount of taxes that they uh, that they should be paying um, so you know we can't increase that we can't increase corporate income tax very difficult to increase um, personal income tax at the moment and you're likely if they do they're likely to increase it at the upper end which they have been doing so the you know there has been talks about the wealth introducing a wealth tax my only reservation with those type of increases is that they punish the very people that have been contributing towards taxes so i think the option is um, yes, they would may have to increase taxes, but um, I think that let's work at the okay. improving we'll on, efficiencies, yeah. efficiencies at SARS. Thank you. Okay, we have lots of questions and we're running out of time. So I'm going to uh, combine, uh, there are two questions on uh, zero-based budgeting. Uh, one from uh, Sakile Onyati and the other from our colleague Ivor Sarakinski. I'm going to combine them to ask uh, to all panelists, given government's commitments, uh, such as, for example, social grants and the public sector wage bill, uh, what does zero-based budgeting actually mean uh, in practice? So, Tabi, do you want to go okay. first this time? So, so the idea of zero-based budgeting is, is um, so when, when ministers talk about it, it came as an idea because what the trend that they were seeing in, at National Treasury is that the budgets were tended to be consumed right before the end of the fiscal year. And so what would happen is that there's a tendency to, to, fiscal, to do fiscal dumping. So you'd, you, know, you wouldn't utilize your budget your, in, in, in totality, and then only right at the, towards the end of the fiscal year, you start then utilizing it. And then this is to ensure that you get uh, the same, by the same increases plus inflation in the next year. Because if you don't utilize it, the money goes back to National Treasury, and then you risk having a smaller budget in the following year. What this tendency also uh, um, resulted in, in that in that spending towards the last couple of months, uh, of the fiscal year, you started seeing huge increases in employment, government employment, uh, as part of this. So in order for him to then look at how do we make this budget efficient and ensure that those who say that they need X billion rands and actually they don't, we need to then have start everyone at zero. The problem with zero-based uh, uh, budgeting exercise is that it actually changes the entire budgeting system. People need to, you know, the treasury needs to relearn how to do it. Uh, it it's actually, it won't happen. It's, it's a very difficult thing to implement, especially given that you want to do it now to solve the issues, the problems of leakages now. So I don't think, I think that um, it's not the right, we don't have the, the capacity, we don't have the time for it, and um, you're not, solve the problem and, the, and that's not how to deal with the problem. The other thing, just two last points, a large share of the government expenditure has become autonomous. So this is wages, grants, health, free, free education. And if you include NHS is going to, and NHI is going to be worse. So if you're doing an, uh, uh, a zero based, uh, zero based budgeting model, you're basically, um, 
you're basically saying you've got very little room to work with because every every department is going to say look there's there's you know there's the, how, how do you change wages how do you change grants there's these are autonomous on themselves the other problem is infrastructure which is what they're planning to do so you need to every government departments need to justify their spending because we're now as a country aligning to this whole infrastructure we're going to grow through infrastructure development but the problem with that is that infrastructure implementation is mostly longer than a year and therefore a, um, planning and budgeting has to align with the multi-year expenditure plans to minimize budgeting errors. So if let's say housing says that we're going to do these big projects that are going to take five years, a budget, a minister can't every year uh, go to the contractors and everyone else to say, we're only doing this for a year because actually infrastructure planning is a multi-year project. So I think there are huge problems with this whole zero-based budgeting model. And I think that's why he actually didn't mention it at the supplementary budget uh, speech. Okay, great. Lumkile? Yeah, it is just a, a term that uh, substitute um, in effective, in um, incapable um, cadres who cannot spend money. Okay, Isaiah? I think it has been exhausted, Prof. Okay. That's great. Let me try. Well, there are other questions on zero-based budgeting, which we will pass on. But there is a, a question on can expanding the deficit even further beyond the uh, estimated 14.6% whilst gearing towards infrastructure investment uh, lead to improvement in total factor productivity? Prof, total factor, productivity, total factor productivity includes a lot of things besides just spending. Yeah. You can just look at our uh, uh, budget. Education is one of the highest expenditure items, but we still have a shortage of critical skills. So there is no direct correlation to the amount of money that you spend to the type of skill that you produce, especially if you do not reform your education sector in such a way that it produces people that can actually make things, uh, not just sit and theorize like we're doing here. Uh, perhaps if we can produce less economists and more engineers, more technicians, that will be enable us to be able to to finish the likes of Medupi without having to import skills from China. So it's not a given that if we increase uh, the budget deficit, total factor productivity is going to increase. We have to do a, a, a lot of reforms in our education system. Uh, that, that is part of what would increase the total, total factor productivity. But spending on things like infrastructure itself has better benefits than spending on current spending because it, it can create jobs. If you look in terms of uh, multiplier effects, um, infrastructure spend generally uh, increases uh, the amount of jobs that you can that you can create in an economy. Uh, but if you just look across many countries, the moment you have fiscal deficits that go 15% and above of GDP, then you start dealing with inflation which is one of the things that really hits the poor the most because they, don't, they do not have enough uh, ability to generate uh, incomes that will be able to, to withstand that, in, in, that inflation. So while we are looking for funds, while we are borrowing and increasing our deficit, we have to be quite careful on what things are we spending that money and how efficiently are we doing it. I think that is going to be quite important going forward because we have learned over the past decade that a significant amount of spending do not translate to economic growth. A trillion rent is gone and we do not have growth. So the same now, uh, we, can, we can have a lot of money, a lot of debt, but if we do not change what we spend that money on, we are not going to, to, to have a different outcome. You know, it's, 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 it's what Mohammed Arian called active inertia, to do the same thing over and over again while we're expecting to, uh, to get a, a different outcome. It's simply not possible. 
And currently, we do not have the capacity in the state to reimagine what we can do and actually forcefully or robustly implement the things they say they're going to do. The reforms have been there for a very long time, but we haven't done many of them. And it's still the same uh, you know, leadership that is there largely. What has changed that will say to them, this time is different, this time we have to do things uh, the right way. I'm not convinced much have changed. So if we stop training economists, where's the next chief economist from Alexandra Forbes gonna come from? The Tabi, best economists are engineers and mathematicians. Tabi, over to you. Uh, Prof, can you repeat, is it the same question? Yeah. Um, you want me to repeat? That, yes, yes, please. Okay. The question is really, can expanding the deficit while gearing towards infrastructure investment actually lead to an improvement in total factor productivity? Can extend in the deficit? Um, no. So I, I do agree with what Isaiah has said. Um, but here's, the, here's my, my theory in terms of deficit. And I think I mentioned it earlier. I'm not worried about whether we incur, you know, a huge deficit. Um, it's, it's why and how we're going to close it. And, and that's why I have huge issues with the National Treasury over the years because they haven't demonstrated we've incurred this, this deficit and it keeps growing. And we've incurred it, I mean, the last, before, in February, our deficit was going to be, uh, what our deficit was estimated to be 6.8%. And that's because they've accommodated ESCOM and accommodated SAA. So, you know, state-owned entities have been um, part of the reason why our deficit has been compromised. Our deficit was also compromised by fee-free education. And so we, we have a policy where we say we're going to consolidate and we're going to shrink the deficit and we and every year we attempt that. But then they curve and government keeps accommodating all this debt. And and this is where the politicians come into play because something like free free education, which is really contentious and I have huge issues with it, shouldn't wasn't a policy that was accommodated by the fiscus, but because of it, we now have the, you know, we ha we now have to pay for it and has caused us to undermine our consolidation and has impacted on our debt uh, or contributed towards our deficit. We also have ESCOM, again, um, you know, an underperforming or badly performing entity that we've had to accommodate and accommodate its debt without dealing with the actual problem. SAA, same thing, and we now want to throw almost 30 billion rands towards SAA, and then we go deeper into a deficit. And this is before the pandemic hit us. Now we have a pandemic, and we're obviously going into a deficit because we're borrowing more when we're, we're, um, we're borrowing more, and unemployment is higher, um, uh, less people are pay, contributing towards uh, taxes or revenue, has huge shortfall, uh, and expenditure we now can't consolidate, we have to spend. So that hippopotamus mouth is open. So again, if if all of this was going towards consumption, and I argue that the money that was is supposed to uh, save SAA, the 30, and just under 30 billion rands, I'd rather they throw it actually, they write checks as, as what's happening with the in the US with the Fed, give to every South African who is unemployed and also uh, below a certain poverty line, give them all 2,000 uh, rands a month sign a check and say everyone gets it and that's one way of stimulating aggregate demand because you started to stimulate consumption uh, as those people will start spending that uh, 2000 rand in the system but again as Isaiah is saying if you're throwing that a deficit of money that you you're borrowing into the wrong areas you're not then your deficit then you can't you, you can't account for the money that we're borrowing you can't even account for the money that we're, that the deficit that we've incurred so being broke but not knowing how you got there in the first place. Thank you. Lumkile? I'll pass this one. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we're fast running out of time. So let me ask the what possibly be the last question, and that is from Michael, uh, and relates to what Tabi just said, I think, and that is 
is spending on social grants, on social security, uh, economically sustainable? So Lumkile, maybe you want to go on this one. Uh, spending on the social wage is not sustainable in the long term. That is why our agenda should be focused on creating opportunities through, through growth and using all resources available. That is fiscal policy, monetary policy, as well as our household domestic savings to mobilize finance so that you can be able to invest in infrastructure and create opportunities. So if you do that, I believe that over time, by re the reduction of unemployment, would be able to have a huge impact uh, on reducing the social wage as South Africans get active in the labor market. Without that, I think uh, we're in it for a long time. And I think South Africa is in that trap where we need a universal basic income grant because this economy, if it does not utilize all its savings, it's unlikely to have a very vibrant and dynamic labor market. Thank you. Isaiah? I, I agree absolutely with what uh, Slumkle just said. Social security, uh, as it is uh, currently structured, is not sustainable. Um, I'm sure uh, he may have been part to, to advising the ANC back in the, in the early 90s to, to structure something like that. But I think what they may have not uh, put in place was what will be required to make sure that the people that depend on it do not continue to increase in number. Uh, by design, a social security system should be a short term to cushion people when they are out of employment and once they, they, they rejoin the labor market, then they should fall off that social security system. But ours seems to be a permanent one, which continues to increase because we do not create a good education sector that makes people to be able to join the labor market, or, or partly because we have a lot of structural issues in our economy that makes sure that a lot of people are not absorbed into, into the labor market. You know, so what we would require is to make sure that the labor market is dynamic. And by, by dynamic, I don't mean we should pay a, a slave wages to people for them to, 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 be, to, be, uh, to accommodate a large number. That's not what I mean. I mean, we should uh, think in a way that we create an economy for the labor that we have currently in an effort to create space to upskill people for an economy of the future. That's how you can absorb a lot of people. But also we can couple this social security system with an improvement in productivity because just merely transferring cash to people without doing anything strips them of their dignity, which means they are forever dependent on government, uh, on government's handover, of, uh, government's cash donations for their livelihoods. It strips them of their dignity. But if they were to do something that government can put in place uh, for which they get paid, then that can actually give them ownership of the things that they will be doing and also gives them some, some sort of dignity. But to, to make the, the, the long story short, social security system uh, uh, needs to be short term. It's not sustainable, especially if we consider that our tech space is very narrow. It's a very few people that now have found ways to circumvent the tech system. Abby, you have the final word. That's a quick one. I think that we're one of the very few so-called welfare states that uh, gloats about the number of people um, that are on the social, that are uh, dependent on social grants. Um, and we have, what, 18 million people on social grants, so that's more than the number of people who are actually employed. Uh, I think that we, to remedy that, we should have a program um, to get people outside of the social security uh, system. And um, that is one way of then alleviating this dependency that, that Isaiah is talking about. Great, thank you all very much. Uh, I'm afraid we're not gonna be able to get to any of the other 
10 or so questions. Uh, so uh, what's left is for me to thank our panelists very much. Uh, if the audience was hoping for uh, economic consensus, uh, you will know from uh, chatting to even two economists that uh, economic cons consensus remains an elusive uh, concept. But thank you very much, Lumkile, Tabi, Isaiah, very much for participating. Thank you very much. And most of all, our audience. Thank you so much. Thanks, Prof. Go well. Thanks, Thanks to the Prof. Panelists. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Thanks, everyone.